The summer of 1934. For a year and a half now, Germans have been living under the thumb of Adolf Hitler. A few months were all it took for him to obliterate democracy. Freedom of the press and all civil liberties have been abolished. His opponents have been thrown in jail. The Nazi party has become the only party. Yet, despite all the repression and violence, Hitler's power is still fragile. He's torn between the two forces that brought him to power. On the one hand, the conservative tendency. On the other, the revolutionaries of the party. He's under pressure, and he's going to have to choose a side. He will do so in a decisive act of extreme brutality, sacrificing the blood of some of his oldest companions, among them, his longtime friend, Ernst Ström, the other great figure of Nazism, and the leader of the revolutionary tendency. It's a wave of assassinations that will mark a turning point for Germany and turn it definitively into a Nazi dictatorship. Thus, in the month of June 1934, an extraordinary criminal operation by the state is underway, one that will last for three days and forever be remembered as the Night of the Long Knives. Berlin, 8 in the morning, 28th of June, 1934. At Tempelhof Airport, they're waiting for Adolf Hitler, who's taking a flight to Essen. It's here, in this temple of the now decommissioned Nazi power, that the story of the Night of the Long Knives begins. Hitler is chancellor. On this Thursday morning, He's beginning a trip of several days to Westphalia, in the west of the country. As he takes off from Tempelhof, Hitler leaves behind him a Berlin plagued by infighting between conservatives, the main Nazi leaders, and the most radical fringes of his own party. It's 11 a.m when Hitler's plane lands at Essen, in the heart of the Ruhr Industrial Basin. From the airport, Hitler heads to the wedding of one of his relatives, Josef Terboven, governor of the Rhineland, and the region's Nazi leader. It's the first step of his journey. Hitler wanted to be here to show his loyalty to one of the earliest of his companions who, 10 years ago in 1923, took part alongside him in the Munich coup attempt. At 3 p.m., Hitler leaves the wedding and drives to the home of Gustav Krupp, the president of Germany's largest military-industrial conglomerate. Krupp is one of his strongest supporters in the country's traditional conservative elite. It was he who created the Adolf Hitler Fund of German trade and industry. After the usual courtesies, Hitler is shown around the factories and workshops. Hitler has come to secure Krupp's support but also to reassure him, and through him, all the country's major industrialists, for they're all worried about the disorder still being caused by Nazi groups loyal to the revolutionary, anti-capitalist spirit of the party's beginnings. Today, Hitler's reaching out to the big bosses. Only a few months ago, it was the workers he was appealing to, standing amongst them as if he were one of their own, in the factories of Krupp or Daimler-Benz, or Siemens. Mehr Recht dazu als irgendein anderer. Ich 
bin aus euch selbst herausgewachsen, bin eins selbst unter euch gestanden, bin in viereinhalb Jahren Krieg wieder mitten unter euch gewesen und habe mich dann durch Fleiß, durch Lernen und ich kann sagen durch Hungern langsam emporgearbeitet. In meinem innersten Wesen bin ich immer das geblieben, was ich vorher war. Wohl aber möchte ich, dass die Nachwelt mir einmal bestätigt, dass ich anständig und ehrlich mein Programm nicht zu verwirklichen bemüht habe. Vielleicht wird manch unter Ihnen sein, der es mir nicht verzeihen kann, dass ich die marxistischen Parteien vernichtete. Aber mein Freund, ich habe die anderen genauso vernichtet. Sie sind <lacht> The next morning, Friday the 29th of June, Hitler began the second part of his journey, a major inspection tour of the volunteer camps of the RAD, the Labor Department. At the Olfen camp, the young volunteers provide him with one of the demonstrations of physical strength and perfect discipline that he loves so much. He is still to visit camps 210 and 211, where they're repairing the Nears Canal. But suddenly, he decides to cancel everything. He orders his delegation to change course. 10 big Mercedes Benzes, including the convertible in which Hitler rides, head north along the banks of the Rhine. On board, his aide de camp, his bodyguard, and several of his most trusted leaders. He has decided they should all get together in a place he knows well, the Driesen Hotel, on the banks of the river. Hitler came here for the first time in 1926. He wrote in the hotel register, Hitler, Adolf, resident of Munich, writer, stateless. Nobody here knew him. He came on the recommendation of his entourage of Rudolf Hess, actually. The Dresden Hotel was one of Hitler's favorite places to stay, a new link with the Rhine. The German Rhine was what fascinated him here, and that's no doubt why he came so often. The reasons why Hitler came to the hotel at that particular time on that day, I don't know. But it's not so surprising. He'd been coming to the hotel for eight years. Hitler arrives at the Driesen Hotel in the early afternoon. The owner and staff were only notified a few minutes before. The Nazi delegation arrives in large numbers. They are shown to the grand reception rooms. The hotel's only telephone booth is made available to Hitler and his bodyguards so they can remain in constant contact with Berlin. An improvised crisis committee is being set up, for Hitler is about to engage in a decisive battle against his own friend, Ernst Röhm. Ernst Röhm is himself on holiday about 300 miles away, in Bavaria, on the shores of Lake Tegernsee. Ernst Röhm is the head of the SA, the assault section, the Nazi party's paramilitary group that helped seize power. Above all, he was one of Hitler's first brothers in arms, and he's one of his few close friends. But today, he opposes Hitler head on. He's not content just to be in power. He wants to continue the great National Socialist Revolution. Between the Hanselbauer boarding house, where Rome is staying, and the Driesen Hotel, where Hitler is, there runs an invisible thread. That of a common history of more than 15 years that binds the two men. A history of friendship and shared struggles. And it's about to break. Rome is the only one who talks to him on intimate terms. 
There's a relationship of mutual esteem, even mutual fascination between the two men. Rome recognizes Hitler's political genius, which he believes will save Germany. Hitler recognizes in Rome a military genius who knows how to lead the troops. And this fascinates Hitler, for whom the four years he spent fighting in the Great War were the high point of his life an experience of communal courage that gave a meaning to life that he sees incarnated in Rome, the great man of war. The friendship between Rome and Hitler first blossoms in Munich in 1920, in the turbulent days of the post-war period. Rome is still in the military, a captain in the German army, the Reichswehr, but he harbors a deep resentment towards his leaders, whom he holds responsible for the defeat. Rome frequents the far right. That's where he meets Hitler. They both join the German Workers' Party, which soon becomes the NSDAP, the Nazi Party. Together, the two men create the SA, the assault section, the militia of the party. Hitler commence Hitler's political activities first begin in the NSDAP. And he's convinced that victory for the Nazis will come about by winning over public opinion, using the method of the time, large-scale public meetings. So he simply starts out by speaking in front of 100 people, then 200 people, then 300. Except that at the time, the country has just come out of a war. It's a country where in 1921, there are still two million guns in circulation. And when someone as radical, as anti-Semitic, and as fanatical as Adolf Hitler gets up on a platform to talk, it's pretty risky. He could easily get shot, because there are communists breaking into the meetings of the extreme right. And the extreme right are responding in kind. There's real political violence. So what exactly is the SA? Well, it's a security service. There are a lot of people joining the Nazi party, the SA and the SS, who are veterans that never really reintegrated into society after the First World War, and who naturally see in nationalist movements with a marshal, even a paramilitary component, a way to exist. What we forget is that an institution like the SA and even later the Nazi regime is a nourishing, protective institution, almost in a material way. It's a pro-life institution, doing what we would call good works or public assistance. The Nazis call it SA Heim, the SA Homes. These SA homes bring in unemployed young people. There's free soup every evening. There's a bit of ideological training. They talk about how it would be nice to bring some order and fight against the communists. They promise adventure and dignity, etc., etc. Obviously, it's a very attractive proposition, and Rome knows it. He plays the card of the charismatic military leader who promises his flock protection, action, a meaning to life. To put it simply, the SA is a revolutionary army. Those two words are important. They evoke an army with the uniforms that say, we are the men from the trenches and we are revolutionaries. In other words, they aim to destroy the Weimar Republic. Although Hitler appears to see the SA as a mere tool, it seems to be a tool he wants to hold on to, and that it actually has very little autonomy from the party. It's obvious, however, that Rome, as the figurehead of the SA, or at least one of its most important leaders in those years, wishes it to enjoy total autonomy. Hitler is not convinced by Rome's revolutionary aims. But in the fall of 1923, Rome persuades him to attempt a coup d'etat to overthrow the Republic. He assures him he'll have the support of the army. On the night of the 8th and 9th of November, Hitler harangues the crowd in Munich, inciting them to seize power in the regional capital and then march on Berlin. 
but Rooms got it wrong. The army isn't behind Hitler, and the coup is a total failure. The protesters are dispersed. The SA are arrested and disarmed. Hitler, wounded, is sentenced to five years at Landsberg Prison. With only nine months left to serve, he writes the first version of Mein Kampf, the book in which he lays out the basis of his doctrine. Drawing lessons from the failed putsch, he establishes a new strategy for winning power, not by force, but through elections. In this new strategy, Ruhm no longer has a place in the military. He leaves the German political scene and goes into exile in Bolivia, where he becomes an instructor in the National Army. Hitler is in fact the one who learns the lessons of the failed putsch of 1923, and who says to himself and tells his people that they'll never be able to take power by force of arms. You have to use tactics because their means are subversive, and their final end is to achieve legal election. The idea that one can turn the weapons of democracy against it and kill the Weimar regime with what is its very essence, that is free and democratic elections. Not only am I going to win the elections, but I'm going to win them by looking you straight in the eye and saying that I'm going to kill you. There is a second political arena in Germany, not the parliament, the Reichstag, nor the parliaments of the federal states, but the street. Without the SA, the Nazi party would have had a much harder time entering the public scene as a political group, presenting itself as a radical alternative to the system. Gruppierung ist, die sich sozusagen als radikale Systemalternative präsentiert. In Germany, it's not only the communists and social democrats, and of course the Nazis who organize parades with uniforms. Throughout Europe, there are radical movements of both the right and the left, like the supporters of Mussolini, of course, who already set aside democracy in proclaiming violence as a legitimate tool of political confrontation. From the start, violence is an important way of creating a community within the SA. You expose yourselves to danger together, and if you overcome this danger together, you feel more closely connected. It's a very important mechanism. Hitler is playing it both ways. On the one hand, formal respect for democracy. On the other, violence on the street. This makes the SA a very important part of his game. In 1928, the Nazis have hardly any political weight. 2.6% of the vote and only 12 deputies. No one imagines that this small, far-right party could occupy anything other than a marginal place. But one major event is about to shake up political life. The 1929 crisis sweeps through Germany. The country, only just recovering from the First World War, is hard hit. There's a sharp fall in production. Factories close. Unemployment explodes. And, in some areas, famine takes hold. In such a setting, the extremists make their voices heard more easily. On the left, the Communist Party. But above all, at the other end of the political spectrum, the Nazis. Hitler's personality plays a crucial role through his oratorical skills, as well as his total lack of scruples when it comes to making his most demagogical speeches.
In the September 1930 general elections, the Nazi party surprises everyone with a spectacular 18% breakthrough, making it Germany's second largest political force. For Hitler, it's the first meaningful result, and it validates his electoral strategy. This first victory has sharpened appetites within the party, and the SA is shaken by a serious internal crisis. A radical faction is trying to impose its views and to grab power by force. Otto Wagner, the head of the SA, can't control the situation. Hitler has to put the organization back on track, especially since it includes the SS, its elite guard, recognizable by the black uniforms that distinguish them from the rest of the SA in their brown shirts. He needs a strong and loyal man at the head of the SA. So he brings back his old companion, Ernst Röhm, from his exile in Bolivia. One wonders, of course, why Hitler appointed Röhm head of the SA again, when he should have known that the old conflict between the two of them would start up again, the old military versus politics conflict. But Hitler probably believed that he had already, with the Nazi party's great success in the elections, overtaken Röhm, and that the latter could no longer be a serious competitor, that the early balance of power between them had swung in his favor, and that it was now he who held the reins. At the same time, it's obvious that Röhm, not least because of the injury to his face, would never be the great orator. He will never be the face of National Socialism. He is well aware of that. It is therefore a tactical alliance in which Röhm's limited capabilities in those particular areas give prominence to Hitler. Röhm rapidly regains control of the SA. And throughout 1931 and 1932, the team of Hitler and Röhm remains a force to reckon with. Each of them has his place and each his role. One rules the streets through violence and terror, while the other keeps campaigning and appealing to the voters. 1932 is the year in which it all really begins. There are two general elections because of a dissolution of the Reichstag, and there's a presidential election. The Nazis give it all they've got, with massive and extremely modern electoral propaganda. For the first time, Hitler's flying around in planes, sometimes making speeches at two or even three different places on the same day. Hour-long speeches in front of 20 or even 30,000 people. And he's a good speaker. Sometimes the numbers are staggering, as many as 200,000 people. And it's all made possible by an invention of the time. The sound systems that allow one person to be heard by so many. They may be the most reactionary speeches, but technically they represent the very apex of modernity. The Nazi's message is a promise of liberation, Freiheit und Brat, freedom and bread. Freedom means that Germany is going to be a great power again. And bread means a return to economic prosperity. The theme of bread is very important because it's so concrete. In Germany, you could starve to death in those days. So the Nazis are saying things that Germans want to hear and that they believe, which explains in large part their meteoric progress in elections of 2.5% in 1928 to almost 40% in the summer of 1932. In 1932, the elderly Marshal Hindenburg is president of the Republic. He's been firmly installed in his post for seven years and embodies the values of the conservative right. And as head of state, he represents the entire institution of the military. 
In April 1932, Hindenburg is up against Hitler in the presidential elections. Hindenburg wins, but Hitler's score is a highly significant one. Then, two general elections follow in close order. In July, the Nazi party come out on top with almost 40% of the vote. President Hindenburg, however, refuses to appoint Hitler as head of government. So, a new general election is called in November, and once more, the Nazis win. And again, Hindenburg refuses. Hindenburg says no. He says, I don't talk to a corporal. Just imagine Hindenburg, Paul von Hindenburg, the greatest general of the German army of the First World War, the victor of Tannenberg, the man who saved Germany in August 1914 when it was invaded by the Russians, stooping to talk to a corporal when he's 84 years old and Hitler's only 44. Hierarchy simply forbids it, except that little by little, and this is another key to understanding the Nazi victory, Hindenburg is unfortunately going to be the victim of a conspiracy by a powerful clique of various chancellors, von Papen, Brüning, Schleicher, who will demand that he put Hitler in power, and that's what he does on January the 30th, 1933. Hindenburg's appointment of Hitler in January 1933 was, in a way, a temporary solution. It consisted of using Hitler as just a figurehead of the government, while placing around him so many forces of conservatism that this mass movement, which Hindenburg could neither understand nor accept, could not do any damage. So, on January the 30th, 1933, Hitler officially presents his government. He's only able to appoint two Nazi ministers, and President Hindenburg imposes as vice-chancellor von Papen, a former prime minister and representative of the conservative right. His mission is to keep Hitler under control. That very night, Tens of thousands of SA members hold torchlight processions, as if their victory were total. Each standing at his window, Hindenburg and Hitler watch them pass by. Their different reactions are striking. While Hindenburg, immobile, just endures the spectacle, Hitler gives a joyful salute. He knows how much he owes to the SA. During the first half of 1933, the government was rapidly reorganized and the essay again played a very important role, simply because it fought the opposition with such violence that by the summer of 1933, it had virtually eliminated it. When the Nazis come to power at the end of January 1933, it only takes a few months for them to destroy democracy. The communists are the first to go. Indeed, less than a month after the Nazis form a government, the burning of the Reichstag on the night of the 27th to the 28th of February, 1933, is all the excuse they need to decapitate the Communist Party. More than 4,000 of its leaders and activists are arrested and interned, most of them in Dachau, the first concentration camp set up by the SS, led by Heinrich Himmler. On the 29th of February, a presidential decree for the protection of the people and the state, signed by Hindenburg, suspends freedom of expression, the right to association and public meetings, and freedom of the press. No more civil liberties in Germany. On the 5th of March, the Nazi party wins 40% of the vote in the parliamentary elections. Despite all the violence and intimidation by the SA, despite the ban on opposition meetings and the repression of the communists, Hitler still fails to gain an absolute majority. So, on the 23rd of March, he passes the Enabling Act that allows him to legislate without consulting parliament. And on the 14th of July, the Nazi party is officially declared the only political party. 
Within six months, all political opposition has been wiped out. Now, there is only one institution left to stand up to Hitler, the army, and its representative at the head of the state, President Hindenburg. But this army that now marches past the entire government is still limited by the Treaty of Versailles signed at the end of the First World War. It cannot, in theory, exceed 100,000 men. The SA, though, will soon be millions strong. And Ruhm has only one ambition, to see his Nazi army absorb the old German army. When it's the turn of the SA to march past, Hitler clearly flips them the Nazi salute. The other members of the government, including Vice Chancellor von Papen, remain stony-faced. Nazification is not limited to the political sphere. It spreads through the whole of society at lightning speed. The people, both old and young, have soon taken on all the ceremonials of the Nazis. the raised arm salute, the parades, and the cult of Hitler. In Bavaria, the land of her birth, where she lives to this day, Anna Heiss remembers. I was 11 years old. It was the autumn of 1933, and there was a huge parade through the Tegernsee Lake Valley. And it was a big event for everyone there. I was on the terrace of a hotel, and I watched the parade go by. There were hundreds of essay. Everyone thought that Röhm was a personal friend of Hitler's. Everyone thought he'd helped Hitler come to power. Later on, we heard talk about how Röhm had become far too dangerous for Hitler. In 1933, after its so-called seizing of power, the SA numbered about 500,000 members. And in 1934, Ruhm expanded the organization to more than 4 million members. He developed something like a state within the state, thus an independent power. He wanted to arm the SA, but he also wanted to house them, offer them positions, help them recover economically, and reintegrate them into the working world. Röhm came up with the key word, the second revolution. It was Röhm who wanted to push further the process of taking power, the so-called second revolution, whereas Hitler had interrupted it in July 1933 by declaring the National Socialist Revolution completed. Hitler says to himself, the revolution is over. At any rate, the conquest of power is complete. There's no longer a structured opposition. Nazism has very quickly and with unprecedented violence swept away the forces of the left, the trade union forces, the workers' movement. There is no longer any political opposition at all. So by the second half of 1933, the SA, in Hitler's view, is no longer useful. Of course, the SA only becomes important when it has adversaries. Now, since it has eliminated them, the question arises, why do we still need the SA? And whether they know it or not, the SA fears this loss of relevance. Hitler and his 
Significantly, it's not lost on Hitler and his circle that the Yasse are trying to expand their powers in different areas. In the military, in the police, as a social revolutionary group against the bourgeoisie, against traditional forces in the administration and against the party. Back once more at the Driesen Hotel on Friday the 29th of June, 1934, Hitler knows he must solve the problem of an SA that's becoming ever more demanding. SA members helped him to power and, after the election, helped him to impose all his emergency laws. Now, Ernst Ruhm and his men are claiming their due, their reward for services rendered. What settles the matter is Room's demands for compensation for his men and for his movement. Demands which Hitler can only partially meet. So within the SA, things begin to deteriorate. And now von Papen is trying to take advantage of the situation between Hitler and Room to strengthen the position of the conservatives once again. Vice-Chancellor von Papen and his conservative friends are also putting pressure on Hitler. They can no longer tolerate that Ruhm, with all his schemes of revolutionary violence, is still clinging onto the SA. Hitler is trying to buy time. But by the 17th of June, von Papen, the same man who had him appointed chancellor 18 months earlier, has had enough. Incited by President Hindenburg, he launches a blistering attack on Hitler in a speech at the University of Marburg, he openly denounces all the excesses of the Nazis. It's a signal that you can't keep on plotting and delaying things any longer. The conservative reactionaries are challenging Hitler and saying it's time for a decision. Will Hitler reassure the conservatives in the Reich and especially in the Wehrmacht? Or will he choose to take his political activism even further and support the SA? But there still remains the simple question of what to do with the SA. Should it become a regular army, a military force of the Nazi regime? The answer, too, is a simple one. No. Hitler is caught between the two forces that brought him to power. On the one hand, there's the demands of the SA. On the other, the public criticism from the conservatives. Both are a danger to him. Three days after von Papen's speech, he visits President Hindenburg to try and reassure him. But he finds an inflexible Hindenburg, who declares that if the problem of the SA is not solved once and for all, he's ready to decree martial law and hand the government over to the army. Hitler would be out. Hindenburg is threatening him with a military coup d'etat. Insofern war die Angst, um so the fear of the Reichswehr and the other institutions of power grabbed by the SA, or even just an increase in its power, was quite real. It was not a fantasy. In June 1934, Ruhm is quietly enjoying his holiday at Lake Tigernsee, south of Munich in the Bavarian Alps, taking walks and canoeing. Despite all the tensions and threats he can feel mounting about the SA, he's convinced he can trust Hitler and count on his friendship. That unwavering loyalty between brothers in arms thing can call into question. The last time they met, on the 4th of June, they agreed to calm the situation by putting the SA on leave and waiting until the start of the new year to decide its future. And Ruhm obtained permission from the Fuhrer to hold, before that, one last major meeting in Munich. It's due to take place in just a few days, and Hitler has promised to be there. How is Ruhm to know that, behind his back, the inner circle of Nazis who have Hitler's ear are plotting against him? 
to get the Fuhrer to eliminate him. At the Driesen Hotel, Hitler dines alone. But he is constantly besieged by dozens of messages, calls, and dispatches from Berlin, sent by Goering, Himmler, and Heydrich. The ever more powerful number two of the regime, Goering, the head of the SS, Himmler, and his deputy, Heydrich, are the highest placed conspirators and Nazi dignitaries, all ready to deliver the coup de grace against one of their own. By entirely inventing an imminent coup by room to overthrow Hitler. To fabricate the evidence for it, Himmler and Heydrich have a particularly effective tool. The SS and its intelligence service, the SD. The SS considered itself a totally disciplined organization, absolutely loyal to the party leader, while the SA only thought of itself and went its own way. So conflicts had often arisen in which the SS was used as a kind of internal party police against the SA. Hitler knows full well that, for the past two months, Himmler and Heydrich have been mobilizing all the SS services to prepare, in the shadows, a major operation against the SA. Heydrich has the upper hand over the SD, the intelligence service that has files on all the dignitaries of the SA, as well as on a large part of the German population. He has all he needs to draw up lists of people to be eliminated as a priority, lists that he will submit to Himmler and then to Goering. Goring, Himmler, and Heydrich all use the growing conflict between Hitler and Röhm. They prepare and provide all necessary evidence to Hitler with his encouragement. Thus grows a wave of radicalization in which Röhm will be increasingly isolated. The Nazi way of government is futile. There's an overlord called Hitler, who ultimately rules on both the disputes between clans and the struggles of the lower echelons. He decides according to what best suits him, or those solutions that seem to him the most radical. The commanders in rank just below the overlord, the Himmlers, Gorings, Goebbels, Ribbentrops, and Roms, etc., all absolutely hate each other. And Rome is no exception. He hates the others as they hate him. Moreover, with all his activism and all his plans, he worries the other sidekicks of the Führer. And they're intelligent enough to sit on all their own constant quarreling for a while in order to unite against him. Goring, for example, as head of the Prussian administration, finds himself up against Röhm, who's trying to extend his own influence. Himmler, as a head of the political police, is absolutely loyal to Hitler, so he too is up against Röhm. Finally, there's the Reichswehr, which believes itself in danger because of Röhm's political and military ambitions. There thus forms between these various factions, led of course by Hitler, a constellation that shares a common interest in the elimination of the leaders of the SA. Himmler, Heydrich, and Göring can count on another of Ernström's adversaries, the army. It offers to provide the necessary arms for the operations, as well as its support out in the field. Everything's organized, everyone's in place, but it's all put on hold on Hitler's decision alone. Himmler, Heydrich, and Göring urge him to act speedily and to turn on his old friend, Ernström. At 11 a.m., Göring sends Hitler a final report detailing the alleged putsch that Röhm is preparing. It plunges Hitler into a state of exhilaration and frenzied rage. At one o'clock in the morning, 
It's Himmler's turn to call Hitler from Berlin. He tells him that the SA has mobilized for today, Saturday. Hitler starts screaming and cursing and hurriedly leaves the hotel for the airfield at Bonn. Once Hitler walks through that door, the criminal, relentless night of the long knives has begun. For he had other plans. The fight against the Jews and the war were Hitler's most important goals. To achieve his goals, Hitler will go to Munich to confront Ruhm and the leaders of the SA in person. He will eliminate them by the dozen in an unprecedented wave of political assassinations. His old friend Ernst Ruhm will be one of the first to be thrown in prison and the last to be executed. Then Hitler will be truly triumphant. Hess Sieg Heil. Now, he will be the sole true master of Germany. The Knight of the Long Knives will be the opening act to all the horrors of Nazism.